Okay, good morning, everybody. This is week six. Um, we're in the thick of it. This week, we got two tools that uh, can be really, really useful to you uh, in doing the this sort of analysis. And so um, we can talk about those tools. I'm sharing my screen so that you can get an idea of the questions and where we are. So where we are is, today is the 21st of February, so we're looking at the two videos that became available. Oh, there's Mona. Hi, Mona. Hi. Um, we're looking at the two videos that are under key tools that came available on February 17. And you can see that next week we have videos on, we start into our section on environmental data. And so we have an overview from Sara Varela, and then we have a treatment of, of climate data by Dirk Karger. And so um, both of those should be um, really helpful in kind of starting us into thinking about data resources and, and essentially what are the inputs we're gonna put into these, into these models. So uh, let's jump into questions. Um, let's see, it's the, we have, we're at 1,200 questions that have been submitted uh, total. I am noticing there's only about 130, 140 questions. At some point, we are gonna make some things required for you all to receive a certificate of participation, but we will do that later on. Okay, hey, we've also got Hui Jie Chow as well. Welcome, Chow. Oh, he just blinked off now, so we'll see if he's able to, to connect up. Um, there are some things in here among the questions where I think the completeness of these two tools uh, kind of got us out of in front of ourselves. So for example, there was this question about what is a confusion matrix and what do I need to calculate it? And there was one about, I'm not sure if I understand what extrapolation risk assessment is. And essentially, you know, if you're new to this field, then it's perfectly okay if you don't know what those are because those are things that we'll be dealing with in a few weeks. Um, very briefly, confusion matrix is a two by two matrix that we use in model evaluation. When we have a prediction of yes versus no, and when we have some real, real data that say yes versus no, well, then the prediction can be right or wrong regarding yes and re right or wrong versus no. So that's our two by two matrix. And most of the uh, statistics regarding model quality and model evaluation depend on that matrix. So that's why, we, that's why we're interested in it. But again, we'll go, back, we'll go over that very thoroughly when we get to model evaluation. And as far as eva extrapolation risk assessment, um, again, we'll deal with that later in the course, but essentially if we, if we calibrate a, a model for a species over an area that has maybe this range of temperatures, but we want to apply the model to the whole world, and the whole world has temperatures much farther out, then our model has to extrapolate, which is usually a bad idea because probably none of our models or none of our algorithms does that kind of appropriately. Um, and so we have to basically close our eyes and trust, or we have to understand what parts of environmental space and geographic space are extrapolative and avoid them or avoid interpreting them. So again, those are things we'll deal with later, but I just didn't want to leave people kind of out in the cold. Uh, Mona, Luis, and, and Huijie, any 
particular questions you want to start with. If nobody says something quickly, then I will jump to one that that uh, I've got highlighted. I'm okay with that. Mm. I don't have a whole hour's worth highlighted, okay? okay. <laughs> I, I have some questions that I already answered. So some questions are regarded to what are what are what are the other options for working working from R for niche modeling? I put some packages, KUENM, Niche, Dismo, ENM, Eval, Biomod, SDM, Spock. The the ones that I just mentioned are for modeling, and the next ones are for for occurrence data to get the occurrence data. SDM, Spock, RGB. There are many options that I don't have in mind now, but you can start by exploring the, these these ones and you 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 will learn a lot. Okay, so you put your answers in column D? Uh, is uh, 1,079. Okay, but your answers are in the column, on the rightmost column, correct? Yeah. Okay. Right. So everybody, I will make those available to you um, on the course page, okay? And just in case anybody's wondering, you know, this is the course page. And I, there's one or two questions per week about something that's right here. So it gives us the, the date, the section of the course, the week, the number of the talk, a link to the YouTube uh, video, a link to download the video file, download the audio file, download the presentation, and then where I'll put the Luis's answers to the questions is here under additional materials. Um, but it's just, you know, anytime an instructor says, I've got this reprint, or I've got this list of links, or anything like that, I'm gonna put it there. And then you can see the title of the talk and the person who gave it, okay? And this link is available on the Facebook page. Um, it's a long code, so I'll, it's better you just get it online. I've, I've shared it about 60 times. Uh, okay. So Luis just gave us some alternatives as far as modeling in R. Um, any other questions? Or again, I'll just, okay, here we go. Hi everyone, in SDM Toolbox, can the bias file be considered, let's see here. Can the bias file be considered similar to an M area? So, we don't have Jason here to give the SDM toolbox answer, but I can give you a more generic answer, which is to say bias files summarize where sampling has been more intensive or less intensive. And so we use that essentially to upweight an occurrence in a pretty undersampled place and downweight an occurrence in a heavily sampled place. And on the other side of the coin, it means that if we don't have an occurrence in a place with very few, very little sampling, then we shouldn't count that too heavily. But if we have a place with massive sampling and no occurrences, then that should probably be more important in whatever model we develop. Now, you can use the bias file as a way of masking to an M area by simply setting all of the um, sampling frequency outside of M to zero, okay? It's a workaround. I'm talking about Maxent, but Maxent will not select any, any background data from those areas that you give a zero probability um, in the bias file. It's a, it's a pretty uh, lame workaround because you really should be using the bias file 
as a way of weighting different areas with different levels of sampling and not as a mask uh, to remove places altogether. But it's, it's one way to, to make that masking happen. We're gonna talk a lot about M later on. And in fact, you're gonna get a preview of a paper that hopefully will be submitted in um, a few weeks that gives a, um, a quantitative methodology for estimating M. That's a paper I'm pretty excited about, uh, but it's not quite done. Here so I, I oh, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Luis. Uh, I, I am going to talk about an, another question, question. So if you want to talk to, to say anything about, anything more about what uh, Dan was answering, go ahead. Oh, thank you. No, um, no, I, I was actually also going to <laughs> point some, uh, point out some questions. So you can go ahead, Luis. Okay. okay what, what question should I go to? Is 1089. 1089, it's right here. There we go. Is niche toolbox the most optimal way to do ecological niche modeling with R in comparison with other ways? And the answer is that I don't think so. It's like comparing cars. There, there, if you, depends on the purpose of your analysis. If you want, specialized uh, uh, algorithms like Maxen from R, there are much good, much better options like KUNM, ENM Valve, Wallace. But if you want to use ellipsoids, it will be better uh, niche toolbox. So it has also another tools like MOP analysis and the, the thing that you can get em environmental data from other sources than, than BioClean from WorkClean. I think that's a, an important point that you should think of all of this as a toolbox. And you know, sometimes you have a tool that does several things really nicely and all in a row and really conveniently. Sometimes you need one specific tool for one specific task. And you know, you have to have a whole bunch of uh, tools at your disposal if you're going to uh, be effective in this, in this field. So Niche Toolbox is great. Luis has done some really interesting things with that. Uh, but it's not the only set of tools and there are things that it does relatively well and things that it does relatively, eh, there might be something else out there. I'm not gonna insult Luis and say it does, it does them poorly, but it, it does, there, there might be another tool that's more convenient or more effective. Next question. Uh, what I was going to say is that I'm noticing, uh, I've noticed a few questions about how many variables, what other variables, sources are, can I build my own variables? So it, it looks like the, the first uh, um, video about environmental data has sparked a lot of interest and a lot of questions. Um, <laughs> so for example, question one, uh, 1086, um, when modeling is only possible to use environmental variables from one source, or can I combine different sources? So, <laughs> oh, you have guests. <laughs> I have two guests. <laughs> nice. Um, yeah, so uh, there will be a lot more uh, discussion about, about uh, environmental variables in the coming weeks. Uh, but yeah, as a, as a quick short answer, yes, you can combine environmental vi variables from different sources. Of course, you have to uh, make sure that they match in terms of time span, uh, uh, resolution, uh, map projection, things like that. The, the thing that you have to remember is any time that you combine geospatial data that have different resolutions, diff even different orientations of a grid, 
or different exact positions, you get into a problem called the modifiable aerial unit problem. And it's like the, the worst nightmare of any geographer. And so it's fine to combine different sources, but you really have to be careful not to munge things together at different spatial resolutions or on different grid systems. Yeah, that, that is one, one for newer users of uh, niche modeling. I think that's one serious problem <laughs> that um, I've seen quite, a, quite often, uh, which is um, wanting to use, for example, climate data with soil data, but the soil data come, the raster is at say 100 kilometers, and then the immediate uh, reaction is to uh, refine the 100 kilometer resolution uh, to one kilometer resolution to match the climate data. And that's, yeah, that is a big no-no. <laughs> And, and, you know, to be very honest and forthright, there were things that, you know, those of us who've been doing this for too long did 20 years ago that were pretty ugly viewed through modern lenses. You know, Mona and I have a couple of things that, pa papers that we published where you'd probably wince at them now because <laughs> of some of the decisions we made about, um, different sources of geospatial data. So, you know, we, this has been a learning process for everybody, but it is a lot easier now because you've got data much more readily available. And it, it also depends who's, you know, for example, who's thinking about these data. For example, a climatologist um, will wince at our approach of using one cloud resolution precipitation data globally when uh, those interpolation um, and we'll talk about environmental data more but those interpolation uh, processes are very uh, prone to errors when when the meteorological uh, data are uh, sparse so yeah a climatologist when I was talking to someone about a climatologist, about our world clean data, for example. And he was quite horrified that we were using <laughs> precipitation at one kilometer for tropical regions, for example. Um, yeah, or montane so, yeah. regions. I'm sorry? Or montane regions. Yes, so we feel comfortable with climate data, with world clean, for example, or other sources of, of climate data, but We'll talk more about where they come from, and yes, that's where they come from. <laughs> what Down has on, on his screen. Yeah. But we are getting ahead of ourselves talking about environmental data, but I just thought, I mean, if you're, if you're interested in the Himalayas and the Tibetan Plateau, look at the huge, huge differences in data density going south to north, okay? Or East Africa versus Central Africa, or coastal versus interior South America, or even parts of the Western United States or Northern Canada. Yeah. Okay. A quick, uh, quickly yeah. related to that question, uh, question 1100, uh, my iPad just let me know that I have 10% 10, 10 of the battery left. But um, uh -oh. so <laughs> question 1100, is related to what we've been talking. Um, how can I make my own environmental variables and make sure that they have the same resolution as environmental data downloaded from the internet? This is actually a hard, hard question, a hard um, process to make your own environmental variables uh, because, because of that interpolation issue, right? You have um, samples across the landscape and you are creating a raster or surface of uh, of that particular environmental variable, so that requires a lot of uh, a lot of thought, different skills, and a lot of data. So, um, careful about how you proceed uh, on making your own uh, environmental variables. There was another question question in one uh, one thousand and uh, one hundred nine. 
uh, it's about whether to use partial rock or TSS. And my answer is depends if you have true absences uh, that you are very sure that they are true absences, <laughs> you should use TSS. Otherwise, I recommend using partial rock because it's the most re reliable source that we have. And I agree with that, yes. <laughs> Which was? 1,109, uh, the question. Okay. Partial rock versus TSS. But you know, let, let's, Let's stay within the purview of what we've, what we've heard about this week, which was SDM toolbox and niche toolbox. Because is this, there, there will always be this, this temptation to jump forward. Okay. Okay. It was uh, about niche toolbox because uh, the, uh, <laughs> one of the things that does the application is partial rock and TSS, but. Okay. <laughs> okay. That's fine. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you, you gave the correct answer, which is that TSS is requiring absence data. So why would we use it in the typical niche modeling situation where we have no absence data? There is a quick question related to SVM toolbox. Um, 1,099. 1099. Uh, 1099. Uh, question number two, SDM toolbox just works with Maxen. Uh, and the answer is no. You can use SDM toolbox to process, pre-process data for, for other algorithms for any. Yeah, in fact, both of these toolboxes are quite generic and they do many processes that we would use for using any number of algorithms. Um, it's just, again, a matter of considering them as a toolbox where you may need to do a, uh, you may need to do a principal components analysis or, you know, some other thing. So you jump in, grab the tool that you need and, and um, you get your job done. But no, not, neither of them is just for MaxM. I see you highlighted an interesting question about that one. That one there? Mm -hmm. Okay, go for it, Mona. No, you go. I've been talking much, too much. No. Oh. <laughs> okay, okay. So MaxM is one of the favorite models in publications. Why not use mechanistic models instead of correlative models? Aren't they better? And you could easily develop, we'll use the stapler here. Come here, come here, come here, come here, come here, come here. Sorry, we have a butterfly problem. It's biodiversity related people, so, so <laughs> deal with it. Well, I can say that uh, it's, Maxen, I don't know if it's one of the favorite models in publications. There are a lot of publications that use Maxen, but there are a lot of publications that use Maxen in combination with other algorithms. Um, and I would say historically, <laughs> the reason Maxen uh, had so much uh, or has so much uh, traction is that it is very accessible, right? It's, there is a GUI interface, it's very accessible and there were, were early publications in the 2000s that identified Maxen as, as the most, or one of the most uh, performant ones. So I, 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 I'm talking about the first part of, of the question. You can continue now. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so this is, a, this is an interesting question and it's an, another one of these things that maybe I've had several answers to over, over the years. Um, in our 2011 book, I think we were probably, we went too far along the lines of saying, um, yeah, we've got these correlative models, but mechanistic is definitely going to be better. And so we're just doing the correlative stuff because we can't always do the mechanistic models easily. And I think that was an error, um, which is to say, 
there are severe, severe complications out there for mechanistic models. That's not to say that they shouldn't be used, and that's not to say that those complications won't be overcome. But they, the just switching to mechanistic models is not a universal solution. To give you two examples of problems that need to be overcome, uh, one is the, one of scale. You know, an organism, let's say we're talking about um, here, this butterfly, right? <laughs> um, which has an odd pink patch on its back wing. This butterfly ex is experiencing climate, right? Conditions that are just right around, you know, within a millimeter maybe. And it doesn't care about what the average conditions are over the nearest kilometer. It doesn't, it doesn't care about uh, what the average conditions are for the past 30 years. It cares about that second and that millimeter or 10th of a millimeter. And that's all that matters. And if any of those conditions gets out of its tolerance limits for long enough, it dies. And so we immediately come into a problem of scale, both in time and in space. And that's going to challenge us as far as doing maps that are broadly available or broadly relevant for a species, any species using a mechanistic model. The other complication is one of, of kind of the the, the problems of being parameter rich, which is to say, if you think about a, a linear regression model, it's basically just two things that you're, that you're estimating, the slope and the intercept. If you're bringing in, you know, five, 10, 20 dimensions, and you might have linear and curvilinear and, and parabolic and quadratic you may have dozens or even hundreds of parameters to estimate, okay? And so these mechanistic models are by nature very highly par uh, parameterized. When we use, for example, Maxent or a GLIM or a GAM to do these models, um, we can control the, the number of parameters. It may be very few or it may be very many. Go, come back, come right back. Sorry. Um, there may be lots of parameters or there may be few parameters. Okay. But the mechanistic models to be able to treat this phenomenon of an organism's uh, physiological response as a essentially a first principles model, they're necessarily very parameter rich. And uh, I'll put on I'll put on the web a paper that Mona and Jorge Soberon and I uh, wrote a few years ago um, that essentially discusses this question. Uh, and it was maybe you know Jorge and I had been co-authors on that book in 2011. Maybe it was our kind of revisiting that tone that we cast of mechanistic models are always better. I don't think that's right. Uh, but I see an incredibly powerful place for them. Um, and we're going to have a, um, a talk later on by one of the, the leaders in that field, Michael Kearney. Um, so th this, will be, this will be an interesting topic that we'll take up uh, later in the course. Okay, let's, there's one I want to make sure we get to because it was repeated. Uh, well, this, this one was not repeated, but is there a preferred projection for SDMs? No. Right? There's one that everybody works in, which is WGS 1984 geographic coordinates. And that's only because it's convenient and it's global. Um, it's kind of bad all over. Um, but it's easy, and we can always project from there to some other projection. 
but really what it comes down to is we use projections for different things. Um, if we use straight geographic coordinates, then we know that high latitudes and really any significant latitudinal variation is going to include a fair amount of distortion. So there are equal area, there are equal um, distance projections, and each of those might be the appropriate thing to use in a given case. Okay, but is there a preferred projection? No. You should use whatever the projection is uh, or the coordinate system is that is relevant to your project. There are um, climate uh, data now for, well, not now, but they, they existed before. I, I'm now using a climate uh, data set for uh, projects in North America, um, and that climate data set has an equal area projection. So it's easier to convert the coordinates of uh, occurrences, of presences, to uh, that equal area projection coordinate system than to, con than to project um, you know, rasters. It takes longer time to project rasters, and, and plus, it's it's always it's good to have an equal area projection. Right? That's I'm getting at. But you cannot have you know global equal area projections. That's uh, that's not doable. So yeah, I mean, one of the typical things we do when we write up our results is we say, you know, this species has a distributional area of X number of kilometers square kilometers. Or we say uh, this species is seeing a distributional loss of this many square kilometers. And you can't do that in geographic coordinates. Mm -hmm. So you can either work native in one of the equal area projections, or you can reproject at the end of the process, which as Mona says, can be kind of a pain in the butt to repro reproject rasters takes longer time than just reprojecting occurrence data, mm -hmm. presence data. Okay, so there were a couple of um, questions. I've got two of them highlighted here. Is there any way to run the SDM toolbox in a free program? Is there any chance in the future to work with SDM tools in QGIS? And you know, this is obviously a question for Jason, but um, you know, he's, he's working um, in the ARC platform. Um, I would, you know, I would imagine that it's on his to-do list, but I would also imagine that it's not easy to make that switch over for such a big and comprehensive set of tools. Um, so, you know, everybody should remember that by and large these projects uh, and these tools are done without major funding. Um, and so it can be pretty hard to say, oh yeah, you know, let's, let's shift this to this other platform uh, because it, it is a lot of work. Uh, but what I will say is, you know, this is, a, this is kind of a, a five to 10 year project for me of getting good enough in QGIS that I can say goodbye to ARC. Um, the University of Kansas spends, I don't know how much, but I know it's a ridiculous amount of money on the ARC license each year. And I think my institute spends, I believe it's $3,000 per year on the licenses, kind of sub-licenses that we use in my lab. And that's not good. That's a lot of money that we're pouring down the toilet. Um, ARC is a useful set of tools. I wouldn't say it's qualitatively better than QGIS, but it still has some advantages over QGIS. So I'm waiting perhaps impatiently for the day when everybody in my lab can say, yeah, I haven't used it in a month. Then we'll just stop paying. Mona, you guys still use ARC? Oh yeah, <laughs> but um, yeah, so there is, 
whatever tools we need in the platform, they exist. So ArcMap, R, QGIS. Um, there were recently uh, a postdoc ran um, spatial analysis that were global uh, protected area and velocity of climate change. So not niche modeling, but um, a couple of, of processing steps he had to, he, he's using QGIS, he loves QGIS, but for a couple of processing steps, he had to jump back on uh, in Arc Toolbox, uh, in Arc GIS, because it was, uh, yeah, QGIS couldn't handle. So yeah, I, I'm okay as long as, uh, at our institution, uh, and probably at KU, there is, you know, there are the um, GIS certification uh, programs, um, and they rely on ArcGIS. So I'm not, I don't feel that bad for using ArcGIS because the community is still big enough at the university level that me not using ArcGIS is not going to change for now uh, the situation. But yeah, I understand. It's, it's a very, very expensive um, license, institutional license. So. I mean, to be honest, back 15 years ago, we all used to pay for licenses for a statistical platform called S+. Mm -hmm. And at some point, the base code of S+, was made available as open source code, and a community picked it up, and that's now what we call R. Mm -hmm. And if you look at S+, it doesn't exist anymore. So, I mean, I think in the medium term, ARC could be abandoned by our community. In the short term, I think Mona's right. We're not going to give it up. Um, my personal experience is I can do about 90% of any given project, the GIS work, in QGIS. And then I usually end up having to go over to QGIS for one or another process. It's usually raster related. Mm -hmm. um, QGIS does vector processing much better than it does raster, but the raster is getting better with each new version. Any other questions, Mona and Luis? Well, I see one, if you go to one, 1,162, um, there are some general questions about, uh, I guess, that spun out of discussing env um, environmental data. So what is an arc minute, arc second? Um, I, these are very detailed, how to set the resolution to rarify data. Um, I don't know if we have time to go through all of those. Um, if I'm gonna, um, look at i'm gonna check the videos that we already have uh my video is um, due in march first week of march but if if needed we can address these um detailed questions about rasters so arc yeah. minute projections things like that you know at the same time you know i can take um uh, I can do that and <laughs> in two seconds. Let me, uh, let me Google this for you. There is, there is a link that takes you back to Google when you put, let me Google this for you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I, I think kind of a gentle word for the, the trainees is if there's something you don't recognize or don't understand, the first thing to do is to use the worldwide expert base, which is called Google, you know, or, or some search engine. Um, there's a lot of information and content out there on the internet, and you should take advantage of it. So, you know, don't don't depend just on our getting around to answering your questions, but rather um, do do some investigating yourself and you'll find that a lot of these questions are just totally totally um out there and at hand um i gotta come back to this one uh, 
you know, in the 12 commandments, you mentioned having an appropriate ArcGIS license. <laughs> That's prohibitive for a lot of people in a lot of uh, countries and situations around the world. So, um, you know, if, if a piece of software has to have a, a licensing cost structure that is as ridiculously high as ARC does, then they probably ought to expect that um, their that their product will be put uh, on sale in marketplaces around the world, and you know, tough. Um, Art could probably reduce its profit margin just a bit, or create a sliding profit structure where they get higher prices for prosperous institutions and more modest profits from um, from less prosperous institutions. Um, it's up to them, but some of, as long as they charge as much as they do, then some people are gonna have, shall we say, unofficial ArcGIS licenses. It's the way the world is. Ah, what else? I think that's everything that I highlighted. But there is one, um, so 1,194, since we are in that area. Um, is there a limit, niche toolbox, is there, is there a limit of variables, occurrence point, or file resolution? Um, is it, what toolbox are we talking about here, niche? That's, that's Luis's. Ah, okay, okay. Nine. Okay. Yes, uh, the limit is depends on the RAM memory that you have in your com on your computer, and that's that's it. If you are trying to process um, work clean um, data from a resolution of thirty seconds in a, in a machine with four RAM, four four gigabytes of RAM memory. You you should then go ahead. Sorry. Uh, yep. Just to feel like we are getting to the bottom of the long list, <laughs> we can keep going down. Uh, so one thousand one hundred hundred and ninety-six. Is there? a sweet diversity of tools for ENM, but it is a matter to pick some, or there's one that will cover most of what we need for ENM. This, this reminds me of the ring to rule them all, or mm -hmm. last week's conversation. Uh, an well, ENM comparison chart would be helpful, I agree, that would be nice, um, but it would take quite some time. <laughs> I mean, the, I, I think there are kind of two questions. One is, you know, is there a workflow for, you know, a single workflow or a single master tool? And the answer is certainly not. Um, but one could take a workflow maybe from each of the labs that, you know, that's run by one of the instructors of the, of the course and ask each of the labs, well, you know, what's your workflow, one, and two, where are the tools that you use for each step in this process? And that would be interesting. It'd be a bit of work. Um, but I do have a, you know, kind of a diagrammatic workflow for what we do here at KU. Maybe I'll dig that up for later in the course and, and see if other, other instructors have something parallel. It would be an interesting experiment, also uh, quite, quite horrifying uh, you know, <laughs> experiment realizing that um, data management and project management uh, are can be quite quite messy, or are quite messy. Mm -hmm. And I am guilty of, of not uh, not infusing into my students a, a very good, very rigorous practice of um, workflows and, and documenting everything very well. But we talked about this last week. 
we talked about workflows last week. It was just interesting that there's now this week there's this question about is there a, a sweet or one tool that toolbox that does everything. <laughs> I mean, what you've seen this week is two very rich toolboxes. Yes. Right. And that's that's wonderful. You know, those are those are places that we can go frequently um, to solve problems or solve challenges that we have as we're working. So there, there's a ton of questions here, um, and I don't mean to gloss over them. Um, I think Luis has taken a run at at answering some of them uh, that were specific to niche toolbox. Um, you know, there, there are some like this one, can I clip the database with a polygon or only with coordinates? Well, you know, if you're talking about some box or something like that, it's pretty easy to go back and forth, right? You create, a set of points that are your box. You import it as a polygon. It's very, very easy to do in QGIS and it's harder to do in ARC. And that gives you the polygon from coordinates and you can get the, the coordinates of the vertices um, from your polygon into, into coordinates. So you can go back and forth. Again, use the universal user man manual. Right? Just get on Google. How do I get the coordinates of the vertices of a polygon out of ArcGIS? And there's a way. Okay. Mona, anything else? Luis, anything else? I, I was wondering if you share the tutorials uh, in the web of the web the web page tutorials of niche toolbox uh, yes. just to know if they they can and if, if they can they could uh, reproduce the examples that I gave so here on the course page it says tutorial video links are at and if you click on that, it gives you a link to, let's see, a file that is, I'm not talking very effectively, there are the, the links for installation, for getting environmental data, getting occurrence data, and then some of the, the more complex processes. Okay, thank you. Okay, so everybody, what Luis did was he gave you kind of a shorter overall talk, but then gave you these, what, 10 uh, kind of quick YouTube tutorials, which are much more, you know, do this, do this, do this, do this, and walks you through step by step. Okay, well, uh, everybody, we'll have a next pair of uh, videos to put online on Monday. Uh, they are about kind of the beginnings of our environmental data unit. Um, and two very accomplished colleagues. So um, check them out. They'll be available as of 9 a.m. on Monday. And I'll see you all then. Mona, Luis, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye, guys.